Hey, Jean Grimm. Um, so I just had to share the screen eventually to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Why don't you try it? Let's see. Let yeah, let's, let's try it out. We have a we have a couple of minutes, so I might as well get this going. Yeah. Um, uh, I think I. Okay. Well. It's, it seems it works. Yeah. Yeah. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. I wait. We see. Okay, okay. So then if I just do um mm, okay, I just want to check out. Okay. okay, yeah, I'll just do play after this. Okay, good. Okay. So let me try to switch back to uh oh boy, I think I lost <laughs> wait just a second. Uh Oh, I don't think I want to mess with the Zoom right now. It's, it's asking me to. Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, da -da. Look, I think I'm going to. Uh, okay, you can see me anyway, right? Okay, good. I'm not going to mess with this anymore. So, um, I, I'm, I'm scared to touch anything that's going to screw up. Okay, so. Good. I think it's time to start. Okay, good. Yeah, go ahead. Morning session. We start with uh, Andre Le Calais talk on UV completions of the PT bar deformations of CFT. Please. Okay. All right. Thank you, Shangram. Well, this has been uh, I'm going to talk about a, a, it's been a fun project actually with Shangram, and uh, this this project started uh, at this conference last year, and um, I gave a talk on some relatively recent work that was on the simple side um, to give our perturbations of Heising, and they, you know, and you know, I had had found two completions of it. One was uh, was very well known, uh, you know, uh, this tricriculizing to icing, and then I had found those three halves: the ultraviolet central charge equals three halves. I'm going to explain this uh, in the course of the lecture if you don't know what I'm talking about. But but uh, Shankar pointed out that he had written a paper a long time ago with this kind of with this actually this uh, uh, this this value of c equals three halves. So that's how we started collaborating again. Um, I gave this talk in Berlin over the summer, and then somebody, one of the organizers, pointed out that uh, Shagram and I had written only two papers together, with a thirty-five years apart. <laughs> thirty-five years. 35. <laughs> it, it, it made me. It made I, me feel a bit old. I, uh, <laughs> I mean. I didn't realize really 35 years. I think that it's time for me to retire. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but Sean Grimm has been still uh, extremely active and energetic as usual. And I, we, we're continuing to work on, on this project. There's some interesting questions that are going to come out, which I will, I will discuss. Okay. So let me try to just switch to uh, the presentation. Okay, good. Um, is this, can people just see every, the screen and all that? Yes, we can see it very well. Okay, very good. All right. So I already gave you the, the, uh, 
um, introduction. So these are the papers listed at the bottom. The paper with Sean Wim was published in the JHEP not that long ago, actually. Okay, so um, I decided to kind of to write notes, you know, by by hand at first. It, it takes less time, and you know, sometimes you never know if you're going to give the talk again or so. Anyway, I just decided to do it this this way. Um, so look, this the so the, the problem of UV completion of quantum field theory is really at the heart of anything that goes beyond the standard model and it's a very interesting question and um you know what i'll be talking about is a, a very nice arena to explore this kind of thing okay so let me tell you the problem very generally in any dimension okay um well one way to understand uh, quantum field theory is start with a conformal field theory where everything is is maybe not necessarily calculable, but well-defined. There's no, you got rid of all the, any kind of divergences and you have uh, uh, some description of a conformal field theory. And then of course you perturb this thing. And pretty much almost any conformal field theory is of this type. It's not necessarily all, but uh, certainly most of the interesting ones can be. Like for example, for the, for the standard model, uh, you would just set all the masses of the part of the particles to zero. So that's a conformal field theory. Then you start perturbing by it. there, the various operators would be mass terms. Um, and of course, all the interactions. So, uh, so I'm going to write this as a sum of couplings. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a pointer. Uh, but I don't think I want to deal with that right now. So, um, you know, you have a bunch of um, couplings and potentially, you know, typically an infinite number with some operators. Some of these are very simple. They might be just be mass, mass terms, okay, which would be a relevant operator, but they could also be irrelevant operators. Okay, so I'm going to, at the beginning, I'm going to assume that is potentially both, like in the real world, that you do have both. Okay. Now, some very general statements is that at very low energies, uh, we neglect the irrelevant operators. We we do that all the time. That's why they're called irrelevant. IR is not does not stand for irrelevant. So, for example, uh, just just quantum just gravity. Uh, right away is, is a perturbation by irrelevant operators. And we don't need to know quantum gravity to make predictions on the standard model. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the, but the opposite is true at very high energies, you know, in very high energies in the ultraviolet, then it's completely the opposite. Then the irrelevant operators become, uh, Irrelevant, okay. even though they're relevant now, they just dominate. Okay, and there's some kind of crossover region. You know, I mean, that's why you hear about, uh, you know, in the deep ultraviolet, maybe it's a string theory. Okay, I mean, it, this is the idea that essentially uh, gravity is the most important irre irrelevant operator at low energies, and then you go to very high energies, it gets more and more important. And then you have to deal with quantum gravity. I mean, it's just it's this kind of reasoning that is, is almost dimensional analysis, but uh, but quite uh, quite general. Okay. So basic questions. Uh, look, you're given a low energy spectrum. What? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Some some noise. Okay, 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 there's noise, okay. So look, I mean, if you're given the low energy spectrum, you start adding irrelevant operators. Um, no, is there's various fundamental questions that pop up right away. Can you, def is, is there an ultraviolet theory that corresponds to this low energy theory? In other words, that under a normalization group, there would be an ultraviolet theory that actually flows down to what we see in the low energy theory. Is that possible? Okay. 
suppose you have not so much data. Suppose you have a spectrum in the infrared. That's what we have, right? And we know the, the spectrum of the standard model in the infrared. So we know a spectrum. Um, is that enough information to reconstruct the ultraviolet theory? Okay. So, I mean, the, the general uh, uh, thinking is essentially correct. I mean, no, you can't, you can't. I mean, there could be many, many different kinds of ultraviolet theories that lead to, say, the, the low energy standard model that we know. I mean, uh, I mean, there could be many different kinds of string theories. Uh, uh, really, we don't really know. There's not enough information uh, in the low energy theory. And that's because there's a kind of irreversibility of the, uh, of the RG flow, which is commonly caused, uh, uh, referred to as a C theorem. It's, it's quite heuristically easy to understand. Uh, um, you know, if you have particles with masses, when you go to low, lower and lower energies, these masses essentially are becoming infinite. What's left are the, are the massless particles, okay? So you lose degrees of freedom. Those massive particles are decoupled in the flow. Okay. In any case, this is a very, I mean, this is a basic problem facing anything uh, beyond standard model physics, right? Uh, they tend to, the subject tends to invent particles, um, add some irrelevant operators that incorporate these effects. Um, okay. It's essential to quantum gravity. Now there, there's an interesting idea in the literature, which is uh, referred to as asymptotic safety. Okay, so quantum gravity Again, the standard folklore is correct. I mean, you start with the irrelevant operators, you generate many, many more operators with unpredictable couplings and everything's out of control and you don't have any uh, predictability, okay? But one nice idea, and I think it goes actually goes back to Weinberg, is that who knows? Maybe there's a very hidden symmetry of... of uh, quantum gravity where, you know, when you go to shorter and shorter distances, actually suppose there's a fixed point, then you don't have to worry about, about the, uh, uh, the singularities, ultraviolet singularities and deep infrared because you fit, you've reached a fixed point and it stops, okay? And I think this was a very nice idea and the, the, the research is still going on. Um, also, it connects generally to was referred to as a swampland. So the swampland came about where uh, it's, it's usually attributed to Vafa. He certainly came up with the name. Um, there, look, I mean, you, you have, you know, we, we know a low energy theory supposes a standard model or some other low energy theory. It, it, it's a kind of natural question. Is it possible that this theory um, can be combined with gravity in the context of string theory. Okay, so there, you know, there's an important caveat. And probably not every low energy theory can be made ultra, I'm going to use this word again, can be made ultraviolet complete in the presence of gravity. Okay, so from that point of view, um, you could maybe rule out quite a lot of, of potential low energy theories, because they can't be ultraviolet completed. Uh, that's kind of the philosophy here, but much simpler. We're not gonna be talking about string theory at all. Okay, well, hardly, a little bit, but not too much. But it's a natural question, okay? So we're faced with the same thing. Here we're gonna, well, I'll tell you some more details. So th those are very, very general uh, ideas. Um, no, it's, it's, these are challenging questions. So um, we're going to limit the scope quite a lot, and just just because not there are not that many answers to these questions, we're hoping that there's something um, interesting in this quite limited scope 
compared to beyond standard model physics in say in four dimensions. So right away, if we go to two dimensions, right? Um, then we're going to require integrability. It's turned out in the, you know um, historically that in, at least in two dimensions, re requiring integrability is not a huge constraint. I mean, there's so many almost anything theory you can think of almost has a, an integrable version. So that's not that restrictive, but it's gonna be very important. And we're gonna, like I said, in ultraviolet, we're governed by, in, uh, by irrelevant operators. So we're gonna be trying to be as generic as possible. And we'll take the leading um, irrelevant operator to be the TT bar, okay, which I don't have to explain here. I mean, every theory has a stress energy tensor. So every theory has a TT bar. Um, of course, a, a, a complete generic theory has other irrelevant operators, but this is, you know, this is very generic. And there's many reasons to consider it, um, you know, based on previous works that everybody, I think everybody here is, is, is very familiar with. <clears throat> okay. Uh, but then besides just TT bar, we're going to add some other, yeah. Remember, uh, in general, uh, irre irrelevant operators generate by under RG more and more irrelevant operators. So we're going to consider adding more irrelevant operators. And the way we're going to do that is, um, was, was told to us by, you know, some the pioneers in this subject, um, given any integrable theory, if it's integrable, there are local integrals of motion. So there's analogs of T, the stress tensor, and T bar. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm not displaying all the Lorentz indices here, but um, no, T, T bar referred to conservation momentum, right? So, if there's an infinite number of conserved quantities, then there's higher TT bars. Uh, and my notation here is going to be TT bar one is the TT bar. If it's for perturbing and field theory, it's a strip, the left moving times the right moving component of the stress tensor. So it's a dim dimension four operator. But if the theory is integrable, all these other uh, operators exist. Okay. And um, it was shown that including these higher dimensional irrelevant operators uh, does not spoil the integrability of the, the model, the unperturbed model. So look, these are the models we're gonna look at. You know? So I've thrown out the irrelevant, oper the relevant operators, which essentially fix the infrared spectrum. And uh, so I have some given conformal field theory, and then I'm perturbed by this possible this. Well, it's going to end up being an infinite sequence, an infinite series of more and more irrelevant operators, okay. which I'm just denoting T T bar lowercase s. So the dimension of these operators is two times s plus one. So. This, the lowest one is s equals one, <clears throat> is a, which is the dimension four operator. Okay. And that's what's partly what this conference is about anyway. So, um, so a, a probe, uh, I think this is the most natural one. Okay. Of course, there's other ones, excited states, etc. cetera. But, um, one probe is just the ground state energy on a circumference on a circle of circumference big R. And if you think look at think of finite temperature quantum field theory, then that's the same as having a temperature where R is one over the temperature. And a very standard formula this is ground state energy having dimensions of energy should go as one over R times some dimensionless function, which we call C. And C of, so MR is 
little r will just be the mass, the relevant mass scale in the theory times the uh, circumference, which is dimensionless. And it's very well known. This goes back, it's very quite old. The C of, uh, of as a function of little r is an effective zero zero central charge. Okay. And if, when the central, uh, when the uh, C theorem is valid, it decreases. It sort of counts the degrees of freedom. And it's kind of obvious that infrared limit, think of big R here, M is fixed, little r goes to infinity, and the UV is, is r goes, is go, going to zero, all right? Okay, old stuff here. Um, people here at this conference are, are you know, played an you know, important role in this. Um, I don't think Smirnov is much going to be here, but Cavaglia, including you know, Robert Detail, played an important role in this subject. But suppose you just take just pure TD bar. Okay. Of course, you're going to generate just pure TD bar will generate higher irrelevant operators, but uh, I mean, there's a way to deal with that where you talk about the effective action effectively, um, where uh, at every step of the RG, you're kind of redefining your TT bar. Um, I mean, there's a nice way to write that, which I'm not writing here, but that's well understood. I like to think of it as effective field theory. You know, if I, if I just pure TT bar, then I'm going to generate uh, many higher irrelevant operators. So the action cannot just be CFT plus TT bar. The effective action includes many other higher dimension operators. And there's been quite a lot of work on that in some simple cases. So that's kind of implicit here, right? Um, but I, anyway, I've, I've turned off completely these higher irrelevant operators. Then, then there's a very uh, universal form for this ground state energy. Um, there's different ways to get at it. I, I'm listing these two, I think, uh, imp very important papers. Um, I think they both point out that there's a, uh, uh, this ground state energy actually satisfies a differential equation that's quite simple. You know, it's kind of a Berger's uh, equation in turbulence. Uh, but there's other ways to obtain this result. Okay. So, anyway, this C of R for just TT bar, um, it's not often written this way, but this is the kind of way that kind of popped out when I was working on it. So, it's it involves whatever the the infrared central charge is, okay. Then it involves the the coupling um, for the TT bar, which we're calling alpha one, right? And uh, alpha TT bar is a dimension four operator, so the ratio of alpha one to R squared is as is dimensionless, okay. and you have this very simple form. Is it two CR divided by one plus the square root? Okay. Uh, now, what was known as right from the beginning? Well, well, if it turns out if, if alpha one is positive, then H is negative, and the square root is very well behaved. Then you actually have a well-defined infrared and UV limit. Uh, where the UV limit is just C equals, C equals zero. That's not considered the, the most interesting, the interesting case. Interesting case is when alpha one is negative, then H is positive. Then that's the argument, the square root can become negative, and then the central charge becomes imaginary or well, complex. So that's a, a serious singularity. Um, it means that if you, you've plotted C as a function of one over R, um, there's a there's a shortest possible distance. I mean, beyond 
you know, at, at distances shorter than a certain R star, which is simply where the square root, the argument of the square root becomes zero. Uh, this uh, ground state energy is not even well defined. Okay. Now, of course, there's a lot of interesting work about what this what this actually means. You know, how how do you fix this? You know, maybe there, there is some um, uh, some phase transition, um, but that's not the view we're going to take. But in any case, the main point here is that. There's a shortest possible distance. <laughs> okay. If you just do TT bar. And at shorter distances, what's really happening is is really um, still not known. Okay. Then there's very two very different perspectives. A lot of this TT bar stuff started in string theory, just the bosonic string action. Uh, uh, you know, the the effective action, um, you know, starting from the Polykov action, it turns out it looks like TD bar perturbation. So in fact, it is. Okay. So in string theory, then you would just say, well, the simple R star, the shortest possible distance is just the uh, string scale. And that reflects the Hagedorn transition. And if it really is describing a string theory, then we're done. Everything is good. This is string theory. R star is a string scale. Of course, you can't go up to shorter distances. Okay, um, but if you're looking at this problem from you know pure quantum field theory point of view, uh, you would take a different point of view. You, you know, you're, you're not going. We don't. You you wouldn't necessarily assume that the ultraviolet theory is some kind of string theory. Let's assume that it's, it's still a local quantum field theory. Then this is not a surprise too, because we already know that perturbation by irrelevant operators tends to be sick. You know, you have end up in an infinite number of couplings, etc. And maybe this is just a reflection of that. Okay. Because we just stuck the TT bar. Okay. So that's the background. Uh, the work that we um, excuse me, can I can I ask a question about um, this connection to string theory? So you're considering string theory. I'm, on the I'm cylinder, pretty weak, right? weak on that part, but go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. But but you're not you're not turning on. There's no dynamical two dimensional gravity, right? It's that you get no, the no. same Lagrangian as the Nambu Goto, but it's not a. Is that right or? Well, I mean that's that's where some of the stuff originally showed up, where there's right. Nambu Goto. I'm not going to be talking about Nambu Goto at all. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be talking it's, about that at all. So actually, I'm, I'm going to be taking, of, of the string. Yeah, I, I'm going to be taking point number two. I'm okay. going to look at this as, uh, you know, as a quantum field theorist. Um, what was the possible res resolution of the singularity? Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's, okay. Uh, that's the idea. Okay, and uh, so the work with Shangri, um which I, I wrote a, a paper of myself before, but this one is much more comprehensive. Uh, so there's a singularity if you only include TT bar. But what if, you know, the question is, can, you, can we tune? Do we add uh, these other higher integrals of motion in, in a way where these couplings are tuned to fix the singularity? Okay. What I mean by fix the singularity, meaning you tune these couplings so that in the ultraviolet, the theory is completely well defined and it's a conformal field theory. So then you have a flow between two, con uh, two conformal field theories in this case. You know, what we're starting, the given, the given data is the infrared conformal field theory plus TT bar. Okay. But that's a low energy theory. Uh, just given that, there could be many different ways to arrive there in the flow from the ultraviolet but we're going to insist that in the ultraviolet there is a, a theory well-defined conformal field theory that is has no singularities okay uh that's the first question and then once you formulate that then you ask you know is it possible to classify 
the possible UV completions. I mean, you know, if you could do that in a standard model, it'd be very interesting, right? They, we just start with the low energy spectrum of you know, quarks, neutrinos, you know, leptons, whatever. And then you, you, you take that all that field content and you can make a, a list of the possible ultraviolet theories. That's not going to be probably not going to be possible in four dimensions, but you know, let's it's, it's conceptually it's an inter interesting problem. So this is the, the, the picture you have. I'm going to plot this effective central charge as a function of little r. Remember, it's little r is the mass times the, uh, the geometrical dimension of the circumference. And, um, and we're always starting to the far left here. We have a given infrared conformal field theories as a given infrared central charge. I perturb by TT bar. So in the vicinity of the, that's the infrared, in the vicinity of the infrared, all these things look the same. But if you start adding higher, different, uh, higher irrelevant operators, then these RG trajectories start to diverge. Okay. And we're trying to look at what the, so to the far right is one over R, right? So R goes to zero is the ultraviolet. So uh, to the far right, we're looking at what are the possibilities? Is there an infinite number? Uh, is the problem even tractable? Can you even list possibilities? Um, look, if you don't impose integrability, probably there's an infinite number of possibilities, right? I mean, you can have, have all kinds of crazy interactions, uh, short distances that you don't understand, but they could all arrive to, you know, to some CFT in the infrared with TTVR, right? Those things are all washed out because of the C theorem, but we're imposing integrability. So that's going to limit the number of possibilities, and it's going to make this classification problem uh, kind of interesting. All right. So these are the steps that we follow. Uh, well, remember the in, the the uh, given data is supposed to be the infrared conformal field theory. Okay. So. Again, think of normal particle physics, take the standard model. What would this refer to is set the mass of all particles to, uh, in, in, to just keep the spectrum of, well, I guess it wouldn't work with Higgs, but um, this would amount, amount to keeping the spectrum of low energy particles. Like if you assume like, the fundamental scale is the Planck scale, then everything is really low compared to the Planck scale. You consider like a massless particle. Everything else is decoupled, okay? So, but we're trying to impose integrability. So first, given this conformal field theory, infrared, we first want to classify what are the possible integral perturbations, relevant perturbations, okay. <clears throat> complete opposite. Right, so uh, that's what's going to determine what low energy spectrum you're going to work with, All right. and then you go to very. We're interested in adding the irrelevant, the irrelevant perturbations, which is, are relevant at very high energies. So then, this low energy, the spectrum survives, but these particles become massless because we're at very, very high energies. Uh, you know, the, the masses of particles are essentially zero. So what we need is uh, to, to do the first step one. It turns out for many in 2D, for many conformal field theories, uh, this, the, the classification in step one is no. Okay, and I'm gonna give you what I think is the most interesting example, right? <clears throat> 
but what it leads to is a scattering description of the conformal field theory in the infrared, which is necessarily in the massless limit because it is a conformal field theory. And uh, we're going to use this no notation. This, a lot of this, in fact, a lot of this talk is connected, connected with the Zamologikovs. So this, uh, you know, the Zamologikov brothers wrote a very interesting paper a long time ago about uh, massless scattering. And uh, essentially, this is an important tool in, in what we do. So big L we refer to left movers, big R to right movers. So given the conformal field theory, you know a description of, you have a scattering description of it, okay? Which turns out to involve the scattering of only left movers with only left movers and scattering the right movers with right movers. If, if there was scattering of left movers with right movers, then that would actually break the conformal invariance. Okay, so here, uh, once you choose the spectrum, once you identify this integral perturbation, then you know this S left left, and you know this S right right in principle. In the cases we look at, we're going to know it exactly. Okay, and but the left right scattering has to be trivial. Otherwise, you break conformal invariance. Okay, given that, so for every of the every one of these integral perturbations, now you start turning on TT box. Okay, so that's going to break the conformal invariance, uh, which means that the left right scattering is now going to be non trivial. And we know from the very early works in the subject that it's a, it's a, it leads to a C to D factor. So one, one major lesson uh, in this subject was that, you know, this, this CDD ambiguity was always somewhat confusing. Um, the D is Dyson, the, the other D is for Dalits, and the C is for Castellano, I can't for, I'm forgetting. Okay, Castellano, okay, no, never mind. But there was an, an ambiguity that was always kind of irritating. And, uh, one thing that has come out of this TT bar stuff is that um, that ambiguity changes the ultraviolet behavior, but you cannot change it too much. <laughs> okay, that's the point. You can't if you put on an arbitrary CD factor. CD factor is a scalar factor that doesn't spoil all the uh, the axioms of uh, the analytic S matrix. But if you can't choose anything, because it turns out um these things uh these these factors modify the ultraviolet behavior and if you don't have good cdd factors the ultraviolet theory is going to be singular okay i think it's kind of a, a general thing we learn from this All right uh okay so step two is given the spectrum then you try to classify left right scattering that have a uv completion now how do I, so you need you need a criterion for uv completion and the tool we have is the, the thermodynamic bin outsides which also appeared in the very early works you know uh, connected with nambu goto etc it's, it's relatively easy there but nevertheless i mean uh, they they recognize the role of that so um, so you can use the thermodynamic beta ansatz to calculate this ground state energy, which just by simple factors gives you this effective central charge. And given a proposed set of S matrices, we're going to require that the thermodynamic beta ansatz has a well-defined ultraviolet limit, which is not at all guaranteed. I mean, the TBA equations are complicated integral equations, and um, they're the complicated enough that, you know, for a given choice, the arbitrary choice of S matrix, you don't, you're not guaranteed that there's an ultraviolet limit. Right? Now, the other thing we're going to put on, which is 
other requirement, which my mind is not totally made up on, is that we're going to require the ultraviolet central charge to be rational. And that seems a little funny, but um, look, below C equals one, all the unitary theories are supposed to be ra are, ra are rational. That's a theorem. Okay. So that's one reason. I think the other more practical reason is that yeah, if we find solutions that are, you know, that were totally well defined, S matrices, totally well defined in a way that, that ultimately is supposed to define the theory, right? But if if the ultraviolet central charge is, is irrational, then we'd have a much harder time identifying what this theory is. So we're going to require this, but it's not at all clear as necessary. But it, it also brings up an interesting question because we're going to propose S matrices that are completely consistent to satisfy all the, the rules of, of uh, the bootstrap, if you, if you will. Okay. And it has a well defined thermodynamic beta ansatz, but sometimes the central charge is irrational. We're not going to try to make sense of that because right now we can't totally make sense of the rational cases. <laughs> okay, uh, that'll be clear in some um, examples. Right. Uh, further simplification, like we said, we don't at the beginning we don't even know if this problem is going to go anywhere. If there's any much content to it, so look, I mean, let's not jump into the most complicated situation here. But so we restrict the so-called diagonal scalar theories where um you know because of integrability there's no particle production but there's no mixing in the sense of uh by diagonal i mean if you start with particle a you scatter it with particle b you're not going to produce particle c okay you're going to produce particles a and b again all right uh so the s matrix is not a it's just a bunch of scalar factors. Okay. We're only doing this for simplicity. Right. So let's let's talk about the Ising model. Ising model is the simplest conformal field theory. Right? It's the lowest in the whole the series of minimal models between uh, C is, is C less than one. Is the lowest central charge. Um, uh, it's unitary. And the conformal the field theory is nothing but a free Myron and Fermi. I mean, you can't get simpler than that. But it turns out that so the, the step one, you have to look at integrable perturbations of this Ising theory. I mean, so this this is this part is kind of interesting because th there's an obvious one where you just add a mass term, and I called it psi bar psi. Look, it's still a free theory, so it's, it's, it's integral. Okay, that's a relevant perturbation. What does that do? It just adds a mass to your. You barely you don't even need to do the, the thermodynamic beta ansatz just from basic stat mech. You can just write down the partition function. Uh, and the free energy and, and the ground state energy. Okay, it's easy. Um, but the second part is that we want to add on TT bar and see where that can go. Okay, so we're eventually we're gonna turn off the mass term, look at free massless myronic fermions, turn on TT bar and some other corrections, higher order irrelevant upper, and see where we can go in, in ultraviolet. And it's, it's going to be somewhat interesting. Uh, it turns out we only find two possibilities, and they both have supersymmetry. So I think the beyond standard model people might like that. In any case, uh, because it's a free theory in the infrared, the left, left, and right, right scattering are, are, are trivial, but in this context, they're minus one because they're fermions. Okay. But there's a much more interesting spectrum discovered by Sasha Zemologikov, where there's only two, as far as conformal field theory goes, there's 
there's only two uh, relevant perturbations of the Ising uh, theory. Well, there's only two um, uh, primary fields, okay? And it turns out that perturbing by either of them are both integrable. So the other possibility, the other primary field is the spin field, which is essentially the most basic field in the, in the theory. I mean, that is the continuum limit of the actual Ising spins in the result definition of the model, where sigma is plus or minus one. I mean, the, the Majorana description is just that we just got lucky. We, we can do that. But um, the original Ising model is based on the spin field. And that one has dimension 180, that's relevant. And then it was really very remarkable um, and many years ago that uh, Zamlogikov, Sasha Zamlogikov, first showed this is integral. And then he started to try to figure out the S matrix. And he realized that uh, uh, closing the bootstrap led to eight particles. And he probably knew it, but I mean, he said it so much, but the ratios of masses are related to the root system of the eight. Okay. So people worked on this theory quite a lot. And so the left left and the right right S matrices are completely null. Okay, there are a bunch of products of ratios of trigonometric functions. It's not important to write them down here, okay? But they're completely null. I mean, there's some good uh, articles that we reference in our papers. Bratton, et cetera, Dory, blah, blah, okay. Um, so we know left, left, and right, right. Then we just completely turn off. Then we turn off the spin field because we're interested in the deep ultraviolet. So we're spin fields is a relevant operator. It becomes mm -hmm. less important, but it kind of fi it fixed us. It told us a spectrum to work with. Okay. And then we start turning on TT bar and the higher TT bars, all right? So, so we, we know the left, left and right, right S matrices for um, the conformal field theory. Now we start returning with TT bar. We're gonna then the left, right uh, uh, S matrices are now non-trivial. And um, we already have some results from, uh, I'm gonna refer here actually to Smirnoff and, and Zemlogikov. I think it might be somewhat implicit in some of the earlier works, right? So for, for massless particles, you can define a massless rapidity, okay, where for right movers E equals P, but you parameterize it in terms of this angle theta. Left movers E equals minus P again, but we're going to flip the sign of the theta dependence. Mm -hmm. And um, then the CDD factors, they were not written this way in the original papers. Um, they were actually written as really the product of this S left, right, S uh, right, left. I mean, if you take the product of these two factors, you get exponential of I coupling times sinh theta. And that, that's what it, the formula originally appeared, for example, in the Smirnov Sam Logical paper, right? Um, but eventually, I went, in trying to understand the, the massless limit, I realized you had to factorize that S matrix into these two factors to get a sensible TVA. Uh, and reproduce the you know the results for pure TT bar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but later with 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 Sean, we kind of understood where this comes from. I mean, last year I just kind of realized that if you do this factorization, things are going to converge. Okay. <laughs> But uh, with Shang, we understood this much a lot better. Okay, so anyway, these cup, these G's are dimensionless numbers, but they're proportional to these original couplings, alpha S in the Lagrangian. Okay, 
Like remember, if you just have pure TT bar, that means that means we have alpha one, not zero, is the only one. Then G alpha one times m squared is a dimensionless coupling, and that's the G one. Okay. And uh well, as Smirnov and Zem logical told us that this should be the theta dependence of um uh you know of if you include higher coupling so gs is always proportional to alpha s so the only identity you have because these factors are just see are just functions and they have no there's no matrix structure nothing so uh the identity we have is s right left of theta times s right left of theta plus i phi is one <laughs> that's it that's simple okay <clears throat> Okay, so that's the only constraint we have. Now, I think uh, here Alyosha Zem Lodzhikov's work gets, gets very important. Um, so he tried to consider in general what this what left right scattering could be. And if you look at the, this is a new S, nothing to do with the, the previous S, which was an integer labeling the spins of the conserved charges, the local integrals of motion. But if you just look at scattering, and you talk, talk about the center of mass energy, then you look at P, P plus P, P1 plus P2 squared. In this case, if you look at left-right scattering, we talk about P right plus P left squared. And with that parameterization I gave you, it's just N squared e to the theta, where theta now is a difference between these masses rapidities between the two parts. The two particles are the right and the left moving particle. Okay. So, based on various constraints on S matrices coming from Lorentz invariance, causality, et cetera, uh, Adosha Zemologica proposed uh, a general form that satisfies the, the identity I wrote in the previous slide. Okay. So it's a very simple function of S of central mass energy. It's, it's manifestly unitary. Okay. Um, it satisfies all the properties you want to know. So you, you believe in this. But uh, what's unknown is there, it involves some, some constants mu that have dimensions of mass squared. right? And we don't know how many of them that there are and exactly what their, their numbers are, their specific numbers, okay? But that's a very general form, kind of, kind of the most general form of a massless CDD factor you would want for, well, I wrote it for one particle. If you have many particles, it's not so hard. Uh, you know, let me label the part by A. So MA, A is one, two, so. Um, up to eight particles we're going to consider. Then uh, the generalization of that is uh, uh, this box in red. Okay, so the some of the in the simpler version upstairs, the masses cancel. Well, yeah, okay, because there's only there's only one mass scale. But here too, there's only one mass scale, but the ratios of the masses are vary. So anyway, this is the right formula. Right. Now we're going to eventually reach beyond this, but you can, in principle, if you look at this formula, you can expand it and relate, relate it to the previous form. In other words, if you look at this form, well, you know, doing a Taylor expansion, you can relate it to this, this form of the S right, left, and S left, right. Okay. There's, a, there's an issue of analytic continuation, but it seems to work, right? So what's our job now? We get, we're given the spectrum. We know S left, we know the left, left, right, right, S matrices. Now we're trying to cook up some, here's implicit, this is a left, right matrix, scattering for left, right. Uh, how many factors there are in this expression? That's what we're calling J big J, depending on the particles, maybe. 
And uh, then we had to tune the, the, the muse to get something that uh, has a well-defined ultraviolet limit. <clears throat> so, you know, that, that's, that's the problem, okay. So we have to work with that. So uh, a very convenient way to do that, you know, because the S matrices are expressed in terms of these massless rapidities, then it makes the most sense to, uh, well, it turns out if you define this ratio uh, and define these betas, then you can rewrite the previous expression in terms of a product of tanch functions. Okay. So that turned out to be useful because the TBA equations are going to be written as integral equations in terms of uh, in, in rapidity. Okay, so now I have to stop the handwriting because the formula is going to be long. Okay, this is a um, pretty standard uh, TBA, but for massless scattering, which again, I think goes back to Ayosha and Sasser Semlogical. But um, given, assume you're given the S matrices, say right, right, and left, left, then the derivative of the log of the S matrix defines kernels. Same for right, right scattering, for left, right scattering. Okay, so those are the formulas 41, 40, 40, 41. And then the integral equations are this equation 42, 43. Okay. So they're nonlinear integral equations. Um, you're trying to solve for these these epsilons, which are called pseudo energies as a function of rapidity. And they're very nonlinear because uh, G star L is a convolution integral. But these L's are the log of one plus the exponential of the epsilon. Okay. But once you solve that equation, I mean, it turns out numerically it converges relatively rapidly. So, you know, not that hard to solve numerically. Then once you have that solution, you can plug it into, you just have to integrate it to get the effective central charge. Well, the effective ground state energy I wrote there, but then then from there, of course, you can get the effective central charge, right? So typical behavior. Uh, <clears throat> so this is an example, one of the examples we looked at, which only had two particles, okay? And the typical behavior is this, where I point this, this plateau, okay? I'll explain this, this uh, terminology of minimal versus saturated. Saturated turns out to be the maximal ultraviolet central charge. But you know, for lower ultraviolet central charges, you have a pretty nice behavior where it flattens out over a large region. We call it, I refer that to the plateau. Okay, and um, the other sides of the plateau are easily predictable. Um, I, I don't think I want to go into that too much more. Okay. So this is probably one of the main tools, but there's some background checks that we did. Okay, so um, let's try to figure out the ultraviolet central charge given a set of S matrices. Okay, so given a set of S matrices, you know the kernels. So I'm going to define these little KABs. And these little KABs, they completely determine uh, the infrared CFT theory. It's a scattering description of the infrared theory. Okay. Then when I turn on left-right scattering, that gives another set, I'm gonna call them K hats, which are integrals of the um, kernels for right-left scattering, all right? So the conformal field theory, G K hat is zero. So it turns out that the values on the plateau are determined by these particular constants. And uh, knowing the values on these plateaus, 
gives you the, in the ultraviolet central charge. In the massive case, this is very well known. In the massless case, much less, but only a few examples really. But uh, here's the story. Ignore the words here. It's, it's just easy to, for me to just uh, copy from paper. But um, you remember J hat is a product of these tench functions. Each tench, uh, remember it's, it's integral of the log of the kernel. So each factor gives the same thing. So each tenth factor gives a factor of one half. But there's, remember, there's big J of them and depends on the species of particle. Okay. So uh, these K hats have to be half integers. Okay. The little Ks, non K hats, are known from the literature. Okay. So let me arrange these as matrices. And then once you know these, these, uh, the solutions to this, to this plateau equation, then the ultraviolet central charge is given by uh, th this formula, which is expressed in terms of the Rogers dialog rhythm, which is defined below there. Okay. Um, this formula, for the simplest case, one particle was in Alyosha Zemlodkov space. We generalized it, and Shangwon thought it was easy. I, I think it, was, it wasn't that obvious, but anyway. Okay. So, given the situation, you can find some generic solutions. Okay. Saturation point we can figure out what is the maximum ultraviolet central charge. And that's when the K hats, I'm gonna call it K hat zero, which is just one minus K, okay? So when K hat is one minus K, then all these, these X's, the solution to the plateau equations are zero. And then the central charge is twice the number of particles minus infrared central charge. And we're gonna be looking at cases where the, the spectrum is determined by a, a, a Lie group. So I'm gonna to refer to that group as G, and this is twice the rank of G. Andre, Andre, uh, we have some limited time. So uh, how long, yeah. uh, can you- uh, Yeah, yeah, give me like, give me five minutes. You know, okay. I think I, I had a little problem there with the, the tech at the beginning. I think I might've started at least five minutes. Okay. Then there's other cases where all the X's are one. Okay, you can choose K hat that way, all right? Okay, so let's go back to the Ising case. Okay, so let's take the Majorana spectrum, single massless fermion. Okay, so uh, left, left, right, right is minus one. This so only left, left, right is not trivial. So there's two cases, and which were previously known. Um, the first is the famous flow from trichloroizing to icing, which is ultraviolet central charge is seven tenths. And then I found the saturated case where the ultraviolet central charge was three halves, but it turned out that an old paper of Shangrim and uh, Alyosha and, and um, kind of related that to the, the supersymmetric version of Cinch Gordon. So both of these have, have, uh, have ultraviolet, in the ultraviolet have actually a, a, a supersymmetry. And the reason it's, it's a massless flow is the spectrum consists of a, 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 a is, well, it's the Majorana fermion in the infrared. And that was interpreted as a Goldstein or a broken supersymmetry. That's, this is known, okay. But looking at uh, our setup, we can look at some more cases, okay? I told you already that Ising has two massless scattering descriptions. The other one involves an interacting theory of particles with masses related to E8. So let's look at the E8 case. So E8, it turns out the S matrices are are can be are very very closely related to um, the E8 Dinkin diagram. 
Okay. So if I label the nodes of the Dikentagram this way, then this is the incidence matrix I. And then the matrix that determines the conformal field theory has this simple expression, minus I over two minus. So you, so you have a matrix of integers. Okay. Uh, to get the maximum central charge, remember is one minus K. So that's just two over two minus I. Okay, and that gives you this matrix here at, at the bottom there for n equals one. Okay, so it's now what's natural is that if you include too many CDD factors, there won't be a solution because this is we already figured out what's the maximal central charge. So, what's natural is to look at uh, a half integer multiple of the saturated case. So that's what I call k hat n. So n is either zero, one, or two. That's it. Okay. So, uh, oh boy, I had much more overtime than I thought. Uh, okay, let me try to go this through this quickly. Conformal case is kind of well known. So these x's are they're funny numbers, but they're related to at least nothing more complicated than the square root of two with some integers. Uh, but that's the conformal case. So the, the lowest central charge that flows through icing turns out was the these x's are actually solutions to a quintic polynomial. So I just wrote them numerically. And then, so here the infrared central charge by construction is one half. The ultraviolet central charge turns out to be 21 over 22. That was a predicted flow based, based on cosets. Okay. And because of that, we know the, the perturbate, the dimension of the relevant operator in the ultraviolet that, that, generate, that pulls you out of the ultraviolet, turns out it's two 11s. And uh, we identify this ultraviolet conformal field theory as E8 coset, okay? Okay, let me skip the E8. Well, let me skip that slide. And so this is what we found so far. But for E8, there's many other ways to potentially change these integers in the matrix K hat. These are the ones we found because we just want to see if we could find anything, but there's probably many more. But we found at least five. Right? So what we've been doing more recently is to try to try to narrow, look at simpler cases where we can try to attempt for a complete classification and to try to understand some of these. These, what the theories are. So the simplest example, what I told you about icing was SU2. Well, let's just go to SU3. The number of particles is the rank. We only have two particles. So the K hat matrix is just characterized by two integers, N1 and N2. Then for each one, you try to find a solution to the uh, plateau equations. You check that there is uh, actual set of matrices that give this flow. And then we only found one case that was beyond that we kind of expected. But anyway, these, these theories were never really completely constructed before uh, as far as S matrices go. Um, so the unusual one, where we see a question mark, it's because I don't know exactly what the ultraviolet theory is. The ultraviolet central charge is eight fifths. The infrared central charge is the top one, the top row where you have no left, right, and that's four fifths. That's, that's a three state pause model. And the eight fifths, we don't know. But Shangren was in the, was in the Santa Barbara recently, and for totally unrelated reasons, uh, Jacobson, Jesper Jacobson there, was presenting some, some, some kind of web model. Anyway, uh, then Shangren talked to him and he said he can get this eight fifth. So this theory exists, but we don't really know what it is. Okay. Uh, this is a typical flow. I've reversed left to right here. So you see you're flowing to the infrared, you arrive at the same direction, but you're starting from two different uh, ultraviolet central charges. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna going, I'm gonna run out, going running out of time here. So well, you didn't 
<laughs> okay. Ignore that. I mean, I, we had we had to go fishing, and I caught this fish just two weeks ago, so I'm kind of excited about it. So I'm kind of, but uh, let's forget that. So we came up with a table where I think this is a here we just needed to specify three integers. Okay, this, there's uh, three particles. Uh, we went through the whole list. Some of them are very transcendental solutions of cubic polynomials, whatever. And then we made a list of the ultraviolet simple charges. Some of them we understand, because some of them are directly analogous to the tricrypticalizing to Ising flow. But some of the other ones, we, we, we don't know what, what exactly they are. But we believe they exist, and that's what, that's what our, our current project is, all right? So I'm mean, sorry about going over time. Um, it's not too bad, I guess. All right, all right. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Have any really urgent question? I take one. For those from the online participants, any any questions? Okay, if not, since we are in, in a hurry, let's thank uh, Andre again for his very clear talks. Okay, thank you. Okay. Shagrin, once the next talk is when uh, at 10 or 10 30? 10 30. Uh, 10 30, okay. Already past 10 minutes. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm kind of sorry that uh, I probably can't at attend too many talks because of the time difference, but um, right. I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to attend the, the next talk, all right? Okay. Okay, okay, so then we move on to Matthew Heidemann's talk immediately. So sorry for waiting. Oh. Right. No, his, yeah, no his talk is right now. Yeah, oh. yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. <laughs> okay, okay, never 